Oh, it, it'll be fine. Okay, we're going to get started with our next session here. Um, our next presenter is Gabriele Villarini. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering over at the University of Iowa. Uh, he received his MS in Civil Engineering in 2003 from the University of Rome, La Sapienza, and his PhD in Civil Engineering, uh, or Civil and Environmental Engineering in 2008 from U of I. Uh, he was a researcher in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Princeton University from 2008 to 2012. His research interests focus on flood hydrology, extreme events, hydroclimatology, economic impacts of natural hazards, and climate predictions and projections. Um, he also has won an extensive list of awards, some of which are in Italian, so I'm going to go ahead and skip those and just turn it right over to him and let him get started. All right, so <clears throat> hopefully everybody can hear me even if I move around. Uh, today I will be presenting some of the work I've been doing with uh, Louis Slater, who is a postdoc in uh, my research group. And uh, you can view this presentation as a proof of concept. So the question is, uh, we know what the history looks like. We know our past. And so one question that we might want to uh, we might want to ask is, what's next? And what's next uh, bridges across a number of scales. It can be from uh, next month, it can be over the next five years, it could be by the end of the 21st century. And so what I'll try to do is I'll provide you with an overview of some of the efforts that, uh, um, some of our efforts on uh, building across all the scales. And today I'll focus on the seasonal, uh, uh, seasonal predictability. And before I move forward, I want to acknowledge the support by the, uh, the Iowa Water Center through their seed program, which led to securing, on my part, uh, over half a million dollars in funding from uh, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers as well as from uh, uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and uh, Atmospheric Administration. And so far, it has resulted in, uh, um, in a couple of manuscripts under review and more are currently in uh, uh, work in progress. And so this uh, seed grant worked out uh, very well for me, and so I want to make sure that uh, it's clearly acknowledged. All right, so we all want to know what's going to be next. And given that this is the Iowa Water Conference, uh, we want to know what, what's going to be next in terms of uh, discharge, whether it's uh, flooding, low flow. And sometimes it feels like we are staring in a crystal ball, mostly because we don't really know. It's a really tough, program, a really tough problem to to deal with, and some of it, um, uh, and basically the main issue is that it's uh, really hard to come up with skillful predictions of uh, hydrometeorological events. And so these are some uh, headlines from the news back in the days. One is, uh, for those of you who might be familiar with, is the barbecue summer forecasted in 2009 by the UK Met Office, uh, where they predicted that the summer of 2009 was going to be dry and warm, and uh, basically very favorable for picnics and barbecues, and it turned out to be one of the coldest and wettest on record, and that spinned off a bunch of, uh, bunch of issues. Uh, and the other is the, this uh, headline from the New York Times that rightfully so says that the weatherman is not a moron, mostly because we are dealing with a really complex problem, and uh, we are trying to come up with the, uh, um, uh, better defined answers to a problem that actually is so complex that in a deterministic way it's going to be hard to come up with, uh, with answers. And so the idea is uh, moving forward uh, towards a more of a probabilistic framework which acknowledges the uncertainties uh, that we have uh, in, uh, in our predictions. So, so far I focused on at least this brief overview is geared towards uh, uh, temperature and precipitation. What about discharge? Well, if you scan the literature for discharge, it's actually even, uh, uh, an even more complex problem that hasn't really been tackled uh, in the peer-reviewed uh, peer uh, literature. And so from our uh, uh, review, what it came out was this uh, paper by Moelet and Meyer back in 2014. So it's a recent study that is one of the first ones really geared towards the use of, uh, um, uh, geared towards the long-term predictability of, in this case, is runoff over the continental United States. And these are maps that are showing you how well we can predict the runoff uh, with a three-month lead time. Okay, so you're basically predicting July 
uh, starting from uh, starting from May. And so this is kind of like this longer term predictability. And what they what they do is they take uh, rainfall forecasts from uh, global climate models, and they use them to um, they use them they feed them through an hydrologic uh, hydrologic model, and then they get the discharge. And one of the one of the take home is that. Uh, even if uh, the forecast, uh, rainfall forecast is not perfect, and we're all comfortable with the idea that rainfall forecast is not perfect, especially if you're looking at three months, uh, six months, a year ahead, we, can, uh, we have troubles uh, predicting what's going to happen next week, uh, let alone what might happen six to ten months ahead. And so what turns out is that you don't need a perfect uh, prediction of the climate inputs in order to get a good, reasonably good uh, uh, forecast skill when it comes to runoff. And now the question becomes, how good do we need the input to be? Or uh, if you want to look at it from the other perspective, how bad can it be but still be useful for uh, uh, seasonal predictions of uh, string flow? And so most of the work that we have seen, and so this is one, uh, one of the best examples, is geared towards using hydrologic models. So you get your rainfall input and some other variables, you propagate them through an hydrologic model and you get your runoff. Okay? Uh, the approach that I've been using, it's a little bit of a different one. Uh, I tend to play around with data, so I enjoy doing data analysis. And uh, what I've been, uh, the approach that I've been doing is a complementary one to this one. And so rather than running an hydrologic model that might be complex that might be, might be very time consuming to run, I try to identify the relationships between the, variab the variable that we're interested in, so imagine it's a low flow, high flow, whatever you're interested in, and try to understand what caused the year-to-year -year variations in this quantity. Now, the idea is that if we can identify a relationship between your predictant, the response variable of interest, or discharge, and whatever caused it, rainfall and other components. Now, uh, if you can do that, uh, you come up with a very simple model that allows you to relate, uh, to relate all of these uh, predictors and predictors. And so that's the approach I'm, uh, uh, we have been using. And we have, today I'll focus on the Raccoon River Elven Meter, which is located here in central or western Iowa. I think that most of you are familiar with it. Uh, the Raccoon River at uh, Van Meter has undergone extensive agricultural changes over the 20th century, where you have about 40% of the watershed in the early 1940s that was cultivated with uh, corn and soybean, uh, while the remaining was native vegetation. Um, and uh, over time, you have a progression and intensification of agriculture, where uh, nowadays you have about 80% of the watershed that is cultivated at corn and uh, uh, corn and soybean. So this is the, and it's about the 9,000 square mile uh, watershed, about 4,000 square, uh, 1,000 square kilometer watershed. It's about 4,000 square uh, square mile, give it or take. And so what we work with is uh, data from uh, daily data from USGS. And so this work would actually would not be possible without the USGS collecting the data, disseminating them, and quality control them. And so what you look at, what you see here, this is from 1927, actually to, uh, to the present. You see how the daily discharge changed uh, uh, over time at the um, uh, Raccoon River. And so what we have done is you see these uh, year-to-year variations. And depending on what you're interested in, you might be looking at low flows. And so, for instance, for every year, you have 365 values. And then you extract the smallest value, the smallest value every year. Okay. Now you can also turn around and say, well, I'm interested in uh, flooding. And so every year you can look at the largest daily value. And you can see, and then you have a time series of all of these red, uh, red circles. And so what you're interested in doing is, can we understand why we get these year-to-year -year variations in uh, uh, discharge, whether it's the high end, the low end, um, in terms of uh, drivers, physical drivers that we think are going to be relevant. And I'll explain in a minute what they are. So these are the two ends of the spectrum, the low flow and the high flow. But there is a wide range of, uh, there is a wide range of uh, quantities between the minimum and the maximum. So for instance, uh, if you have 365 values every year, you can compute the median discharge, which is the value that is exceeded by half of the data, and is the value that exceeds half of the data. And so in that case, you would be looking at the 
And so we look at every single quantile from the minimum to the maximum and basically everything in between. Because the idea is that some of these results might be more relevant, some of this quantity be, might be more relevant for different applications. And so we want to, uh, rather than just focusing on extremes, we want to look at everything that uh, we, can, uh, we can analyze. All right, so in terms of predictors, um, when I started working on this, uh, the first thing that came to mind is uh, climate. And so rainfall has to be there as a relevant predictor. And then these are highly urbanized, um, highly agricultural watersheds. And so the, we, wanted to include, uh, we wanted to include the predictor that characterizes how agriculture intensity has been changing over time. And so here what I'm showing you are the two time series of our predictors. Uh, basin average rainfall and uh, combined corn and soybean uh, uh, harvested acreage. And so they exhibit quite striking differences in terms of temporal variations. In uh, rainfall, as we would expect, varies uh, much, much more over, uh, over um, from year to year than uh, agriculture. Rainfall, uh, it's, a, it's much harder to predict. Uh, it, has, uh, it doesn't really have much structure. It's hard to come up with a pattern uh, of change over, uh, over time. Agriculture, on the other hand, shows a much more deterministic uh, structure, where you have uh, increasing in agriculture in the early 1940s, uh, where you have a very strong increase up until the 70s and the 80s. And then you have a plateau in, uh, associated with the fact that basically you have cultivated everything that was worth cultivated, and now you're left with uh, marginal land. And so these are the two predictors that I'll include to try to explain uh, how this charge uh, has been changing over time. And uh, you see these are standardized anomalies. Uh, the only thing that we have done is uh, we have removed the mean and divided by the standard deviation for each of the two predictors so that basically they come down roughly to the same scale between minus two and plus two. And this has to do with the fact that the rainfall goes up to, let's say, 1,000 millimeters per year, while uh, um, harvested corn and soybean acreage is in the millions, uh, the millions of uh, acres. And so it's more from a um, model, uh, model, uh, model fitting, uh, model fitting issue. So, what kind of model do we use? There are a few details that I'm going to sweep under the rug, but I'm happy to answer questions on it. So, if we are all comfortable with linear regression, that's basically how, the way I look at it: is linear regression on steroids, nothing more, nothing less. So, what you have, you have your uh, quantity of interest. In this case, could be the Q minimum, Q maximum, whatever discharge you want. And then you try to relate these quantities to predictors. Okay? Now, instead of being a linear regression where you only have uh, uh, one, uh, you are only controlling for the changes in the uh, magnitude, here we want to control for the year to year changes in both magnitude and variability. And so it's a little bit more of a, a little bit more complex model, but the structure is the same. You see that there is. A, basically a linear relationship that connects the average with the predictors. And the way we have structured the predictors is a very simple one. We could come up with way more complex relationship. We could come up with way more complex, way larger number of predictors. But the, what we try to come up with is give me something that works well and it's simple. Okay? And so here what you have, you have rainfall, which plays, uh, which plays a big role. And then you have also rainfall, uh, which interacts with agriculture, with the idea that uh, agriculture per se doesn't really change discharge, but agriculture acts more like a filter that amplifies or mutes the rainfall, uh, uh, the rainfall signal. And so you can look at it almost as a runoff coefficient that changes from year to year, depending on agriculture. And so now this is, uh, again, I glaze over a bunch of details. But I think that this is what uh, really matters, is how well can we reproduce the historical record with these very simple models. And so the way you read these figures is from the top, down here you go from low flow to high flow. Uh, the gray circles are the observations, which is what we're trying to mimic. Now these are probabilistic models, which means that you are going to have, for a given year, you're going to have an entire range of values. But if you focus on the uh, dark red line, that's your median. So basically, if you have to come up with one number, the median will probably be your best shot. And you can see how these very simple models, remember, they only take ag and rainfall as predictors, 
how they can actually explain really, really well the year-to-year -year variations in this chart. Uh, they go up and down, even, the, even the, the width of the distributions, if you look at them almost like as uncertainties, they're not really uncertainties, they're pretty tight. I mean, it's remarkable how well with uh, just linear regression, basically, you can, uh, you, can characterize, uh, you can characterize the variability in the data. And so, okay, now we have a framework, we have a modeling uh, setup that we believe uh, works reasonably well in describing how discharge uh, from low flow to high flow and everything in between has been changing over time. And so this, uh, now that we have this framework, then the next question becomes, okay, what can we do with it? And so now we can start asking a number of different questions. We can say, okay, if you give me what the future rainfall is going to look like, and you can come up with a reasonable estimate, and I'll elaborate on this, of what AGMA look like. So if you have some forecast or predictions of your two predictors, now you can actually have the forecast distribution for a discharge from low flow to high flow. And so we've done work on the, the centennial scale, which I'm not going to talk about here, where we look at how this charge is projected to change over the 21st century. And the, the nice thing is that with these simple models, you can start playing games. And so you can start asking the question, OK, rainfall is projected to increase. Uh, flooding is projected to become more intense. Can we use agriculture to offset some of these increasing trends? And so you can start playing games uh, in terms of agricultural intensity and how that could give you a reduction in discharge. But this is uh, for another day. And today I'm going to focus on the seasonal, uh, seasonal predictions. So if you remember, this is the model that I mentioned before. Okay, So that was the original study I did. But now the question is, uh, this was one model, and there is an infinite, an infinite number of other possible formulations to consider. We really don't know what the true model is, because we only have uh, one set of uh, one time series. We can only say whether a model doesn't fit. We cannot say with certainty that that's the right model. And so we acknowledge this by adding a few other model formulations. One, which is a simplified version where the mean it basically is modulated in the same way. But now the sigma parameter that was tied to the variability, we keep it constant. Because in the original form model, uh, in the original paper, it turns out that the sigma parameter wasn't very sensitive to either agriculture or uh, um, rainfall. And then we come up with another model. So we have three models. Now this one is uh, the same as the one above, but now we include an additional term. This additional term has the goal of somehow characterize the antecedent soil moisture conditions. And so here what you look at is the rainfall the month prior to the, to the season of interest. And so the idea is uh, if you're looking at uh, spring, uh, which is March, April, and May, having something that very simply characterized how saturated or dry the soil is, uh, is incorporated in this case by the rainfall for the month of February. So again, these are really simple models that, and I'll explain how we can also improve on this. But now we have three possible model formulations. Okay? We don't know which one the right one is. It could be that one works better for low flow and another one works better for high flows. And so what we have done, we have developed a system, a framework that actually allows you to merge all of these different, uh, all of these three different models in an optimal, uh, optimal way. So now we are shifting gear a little bit because before the focus was on the annual time scale. Now we're looking at modeling each individual season separately. And so here what you see is uh, low flows, medium flow, and the uh, annual maxima. And so this would be the, the time, the circles are the time series of the daily maximum uh, discharge for the summer season, OK? And so you can see that, uh, I mean, again, uh, this is, uh, these are just variations on linear regression. And uh, we, are, uh, we are able to capture really well how there are changes at the seasonal level from low flows uh, into the high flows. It works mostly, it works much better for spring and summer. For uh, fall and winter, it doesn't, uh, these models, they don't provide uh, uh, a fit that is as good as the one we have for spring and summer. But I guess part of the problem is that spring and summers are so good that it's hard to even uh, compete with them. But anyway, so this is, uh, this, is what, uh, this is what it looks like. And so now the question becomes, OK, give me the prediction of precipitation. Give me the forecast of precip, and I'll give you the forecast of uh, discharge. 
And so this is a preliminary study. This is a study that we did looking at the continental US and focusing on eight global climate models that provide uh, temperature and precipitation forecast with the lead time from one month up to a year. And so here we have looked at uh, not only the overall climatology, how well these models were able to reproduce this, we have also looked at extreme events, extreme events intended both in terms of floods and droughts. And so are these models good? Well, they can be better. There is always room for improvement. But again, the question is, so what we are going to try to, what we want to try to do is we want to try to get as close as possible to the observations. And here it's a different lead time. So this is the shorter lead time and it goes to the longer lead time. So how good are these models? Well, they're f what did I write? Uh, they show some skill. Well, there is always a room to make them uh, better. But then the question becomes, how skillful do they have to be in order to make them useful for stream flow predictions? Okay. And so what I'm showing you here is for the, Raccoon, for the Raccoon River itself. So this is the basin average rainfall from the observations on the x-axis and the forecast on the y-axis for each of the seasons. Darker colors are for shorter lead times, light paler colors are for longer lead times. And so here you see that in spring and summer, are they, there is a tendency for the shorter lead time to be better than the longer lead time. Or put it differently, the shorter lead time are not nearly as bad as the longer lead times. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, keep in mind a couple of things. One, these are one degree by one degree models. And so it means 100 kilometer, roughly 100 kilometer pixel by 100 kilometer pixels. And so you are assuming that much of the spatial variability within the Raccoon River is constrained within just a few pixels. So we don't have that level of details that we might find useful. The other element is that we haven't really done any massaging to the climate models. All we have done, we have removed the mean and divided by the standard deviation. So the way I perceive this is that these are almost like lower bound estimates on how well they can be. And we are doing work on improving, uh, improving on this. And so spring and summer, there is at least a positive relationship. It goes in the right direction. Fall and winter, it's a little bit anybody's, uh, anybody's guess. And so that also has an effect then when we do the stream flow forecast for these two seasons. But overall, the question is, OK, given that this is what it looks like, can we do anything with it? And so the approach that we have used is what's called a retroactive validation. My perspective is that as new, so we have a model, the statistical models that I showed you before, that are calibrated or trained, for instance, to the historical period up to the year 2000. Okay? So we have a certain, certain values of the parameters up to the year 2000. Now, what you, we, what you can do is like, OK, now we have the rainfall predictions for 2001. So we feed it to the model. As far as agriculture, we're using a persistent forecast. What it means is that <coughs> next, year, uh, next year, the forecast for the upcoming year is going to be equal to the observed value for this year. OK, we don't know what's going to look like, but uh, that's, what, uh, that's what we're using. And so then you get the rainfall predictions for the upcoming uh, uh, upcoming year. So this is annual max. Uh, this is the spring maximum daily discharge uh, for the spring season. So it's March, April, and May initialized in March. Okay. And so this is our. Uh, these are three quantiles from our probabilistic uh, distribution. And then you say, okay. Then uh, this is the observed value that we can uh, afterwards evaluate with respect to. We can evaluate with respect to this. All right, so now we have an additional year. What do we do? Well, we retrain the model. We reestimate the model, including the new observation, and issue the forecast for the upcoming, upcoming year. And so you can imagine this done repeatedly. As new information becomes available, we keep on reestimating the, model, uh, re the model, uh, uh, model's parameters, because in theory, they should become more robust, because now you have more and more data to train the model on. And so you see this keeps on, I know I'm in the way. But this keeps on going and going. And so you see it goes. Uh, remember, these are probabilistic forecasts by nature. So we have an entire distribution. And so you would expect variability from year to year. You don't expect them to be right on the money all the time. But you can see how, this, uh, how the system works. We, get the, we, get, we issue the forecast, verify with respect to the observation, and then keep on uh, updating the models uh, 
models parameters. Okay, so this is the framework itself. Okay, it's a dynamically changing, a dynamically changing system. All right, so the one thing that I want to drive home are a couple of points. One, as I showed you before, if you have perfect inf information in terms of rainfall, you actually have very, very quote unquote skillful modeling reproducing the year to year variations, which is great. The other element is that, remember, we are asking a really challenging question. We're not asking, like, is it going to be wetter than before or is it going to be drier than before? We are asking a six to a year ahead. For the next uh, spring, give me the, large, the maximum daily discharge. Okay? So it's a very precise, a very accurate question that we're asking, for which we are very fine, uh, and uh, we are very fine against that. All right, so let's see how this looks. So uh, the next few slides are just going to be the uh, entire uh, verification. And so these are uh, spring discharge. So these are the spring discharge for uh, low flow to high flow initialized at the beginning of spring. So these are forecast initialized in March for March, April, and May. These are forecast initialized October of the previous year for the spring season. And so these are forecast initialized in June of the previous year. So basically, as June of this year comes, we would be able to issue the forecast for spring 2017. So it's about a year long, uh, year long uh, forecast. Is it perfect? No. Would you expect a perfect forecast? You would probably be worried if I show the perfect forecast a year ahead. But nonetheless, you are able to capture some of the salient features of these models, of, these, uh, of the observations. Uh, overall, it tends to be a little bit better, shorter lead time. But the nice thing is that the forecast skill tends to persist over uh, different lead times. Um, in, the, in the summer, it almost uh, it actually works, uh, works even better. You have, uh, a much better, a much better performance than basically any of the other, uh, any of the other seasons. And part of it has to do with the factors that we incorporate into the model formulation, and that leads also to potential improvement on this, uh, uh, on these models. Fall and winter, uh, we are uh, uh, there is room for improvement. Just to say, they are okay, but also keep in mind when do we get the largest flooding? They are generally okay. Beside. Uh, Last, uh, last fall and winter. When do we get them? It's basically spring and summer. So if you can, from a flooding perspective, if you can capture spring and fall, spring and summer, you are in good shape. So again, there is, uh, it works reasonably well, but definitely not nearly as well as uh, spring and summer. So then what we've done, we've also verified uh, this forecast. Uh, the way you read it is, you have the four seasons, you have from low flow to high flow, and from short lead time to long lead time, and so, is it perfect? No, again, but I mean, here we are uh, trying to ask, uh, with respect to the median, how well can you do the forecast? And so, you, depending on what you're looking at, you, can, you tend to perform better during uh, uh, the summer, as I mentioned. I want to point your attention to this one. This is called the mean absolute scaled error. And so, the idea here is that you are very fine your forecast with respect basically to persistence. So can you do better than uh, propagating previous year observations and use that as uh, this year's uh, forecast? Kind of like as a benchmark, can we do better than a previous year observation? And so overall, the, if the values are smaller than one, so if you're in the red, it means yes. And so it tends to work better than uh, simple forecast uh, in the high, uh, on the upper, uh, upper tails so of the flooding in the the larger discharge varies in the spring. Overall, in the summer, it works better. And in the fall, it tends to be a little bit better in the low flows. And in the winter, as I mentioned, it, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, try and improve on that. Okay. Now, I'm basically done. This is the forecast for 2016. So this is the forecast for the Raccoon River that, quote unquote, we are, I don't want to call it issuing, but this is uh, just to stick, uh, stick our neck out is uh, how, might it, how it might look like. And so here we are comparing it against uh, the black line is the average between uh, 2001 and 2015. And so overall, if the white, which is the median of the distrib forecast distribution, is above the black line, it means that uh, it's going to be higher than the average over the past 14, 15 years. If it's below, then it means it's uh, lower. And so especially for the summertime, there is a tendency to be below average conditions with respect to this 2001, 2015, and only time will tell uh, how, well, uh, how well this is uh, verified. 
And so now, to, just to wrap up, uh, uh, what I try to, pro to point you to is that uh, we have, uh, uh, you can uh, reproduce uh, very simply, in a very simple manner, the year-to-year -year variations in discharge, whether it's at the annual scale or whether it's at the seasonal scale, across a broad range of quantities, from low flow to high flow, and everything in between. And um, using even imperfect climate information for the forecast, you can still do reasonably well in terms of stream flow forecasting. All right, so where do we go from there? Well, what we are currently working on is to extend this analysis over the entire central, uh, central United States. And now, when we move even further north, we have to improve and modify our uh, modeling framework. Why? Because then snow melt is going to become more and more important. And so what we will do will incorporate a predictor, or we are going to incorporate some waste uh, uh, temperature or some kind of a temperature, uh, some kind of uh, snow melt uh, proxy through temperature in order to be able to characterize potential snow melt. And so that's something we are working on. And we are currently working on decadal prediction. So what's going to be next year up to the next 10 years? And so I have another postdoc in my group who has been doing quite a bit of work on the bias correcting and downscaling decadal predictions of climate variables. And so what we are generating are four kilometer monthly decadal predictions of temperature and precip at the continental scale. And so what we want to do is we want to use this as input to this simple model. So with this, I'll, uh, hopefully I was on time. And I'll take uh, it. We're a little bit over. We've got six minutes before the next session starts. Okay. So we could take maybe one or two questions real quick if anybody has any.